Um, we are honored tonight to have Marlo Miller with us, uh, who has come just down the road from Amherst. Um, Marlo received her BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and her MA and PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Since 1999, she's taught in the history department at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, uh, where she's currently an associate professor of history as well as director of the public history program. Um, Marlo's publications include The Needles and Eye, Women and Work in the Age of Revolution, published by UMass Press in 2006, uh, and Cultivating a Past, Essays on the History of Hadley, Massachusetts, also published by UMass in 2009. Um, but tonight, I don't have a copy of it, it's over there. Oh, you go. Um, she is here to talk about a new book, Betsy Ross and the Making of America, which she will be signing afterwards. Um, uh, Marla had a luxurious year-long fellowship at the Star Center for the American Experience at Washington College in 2009-2010 to put finishing touches on this book, um, but I'm sure it didn't compare at all to her month-long fellowship here <laughs> while she was in graduate school um, back in 1994 when she was here as a Peterson Fellow. So please join me in welcoming Marla Miller back to the Thank you for that lovely introduction and uh, thanks to Jim Moran for uh, facilitating my visit here tonight. I do indeed have very warm memories of my fellowship at uh, the Antiquarian Society and if you ask me about it in the q and I'll tell you about the raincoat that I acquired while I was here. Um, <laughs> thanks to the lovely doorman. But, um, but uh, so tonight we're here to talk about Betsy Ross and I just uh, gave a talk to a group of college students and I usually like to start uh, lectures by asking people what they already know about Betsy Ross, and it's surprising to me how little college students do tend to know about Betsy Ross, but I, I just want to start by doing that here. So what do you guys already know about Betsy Ross? So the first flag, yeah? And uh, anything else that we know about her? Where does she live? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. See, this crowd I knew would know the answers to the pop quiz. Uh, anything else? What does she do for a living? Seamstress, very good, very good. Um, anything else, a little fun fact? Married several times. Married several times, very good. How do you come to know that? You, oh, you're getting ahead of me. Very good, very good. Um, yes, yeah, so well, everyone tends to know just a wee bit about Betsy Ross because she has become this sort of standard figure in the American lexicon. And so what I thought I would do a little bit tonight is talk about how I came to write the book, uh, what led me to this project, and a little bit about how I went about the research, uh, which tended to be a little bit of a tough nut, tough nut to crack from time to time. And then, of course, uh, in the end, I'll get to some of my findings. But I want to leave plenty of time for a discussion, because I always think it's more interesting to hear what your questions about this project actually are. So we'll leave plenty of space for that at the end. Um, so, how I came to write this book. Uh, my first book, as Paul mentioned, is a book called The Needle's Eye, Women and Work in the Age of Revolution. And that's a study of women in the clothing trades. Uh, it came out of a project that I did as an undergraduate at Historic Deerfield. I was a junior and came out from Wisconsin to Western Mass for the first time and worked on a study of a diary of a woman named Rebecca Dickinson. And Dickinson had never married. She was born in 1738 and in the 1780s burned all of her early journals, rededicated herself to God, and started writing about what it was like to be an unmarried woman in the early republic. Um, it's, it's a very powerful journal that uh, I recommend to anyone to read. So I wrote about her for my senior thesis, and that led on to the master's thesis and the dissertation. And along the way, I got interested in how Dickinson was supporting herself as a never married woman. And I could tell from her diary that she was a gown maker. And so I traipsed off to the library and thought I would check out a book about gown making in the early republic so that I could understand this part of her life. And found that not only was there no literature on gown making in early New England, but in fact our understanding of women in any artisanal trade was pretty weak. Uh, scholarship on craft in early America tended to be grounded in occupations that men had. Uh, silversmiths, uh, house carpenters, carpentry, cabinet making. And so I started to see that we don't know very much, or didn't at that time, about women in artisanal work. And so that really became the core of this book, The Beatles Eye. I wanted to recover this world of craft skill among um, 
women who both were apprentices and trained apprentices, who were employee, um, employers and employees, and really recovered this very complicated world of women and work. And part of the reason I wanted to do that is because popular historical imagination tends to give us a much uh, more simplistic view of early American women's work. And so if you think about the sort of um, you know, iconic colonial good wife that we have in popular historical imagination, the woman who you know, spun the threads and wove the threads into cloth and made the cloth into clothing, and then you know, on her break dipped some candles and you know, maybe shared some sheep, I don't know, you know, made some. And so I could see that this, this idea about the way women worked in early America could not reflect any woman's reality. And it was important to me to really think about that in Needle's Eye because I was thinking about this notion that there is this era before women went to work. And I thought it was important to really disabuse the historical literature of that. Women have always worked. Married women have always worked for wages. And so that book was really an effort to recover that story. And in it, I wanted to mention, you know, the sort of popular uh, historical imagination that, that offers us the good wife. And so I wrote a little bit about where we come to find that imagery. And so I have a little bit in there about Colonial Barbie. Um, my, my college students tend to know Colonial Barbie. But Mattel, when they came out with a doll to sort of address the challenge of the American Girls series, which you may know, came up with this little historical series of dolls. And Colonial Barbie has a piece of needlework, this little quilt square. And so I was wondering, you know, what is it about early American women that makes people want to put a needle in and the other popular icon from early America that I knew at the time was Betsy Ross. Betsy Ross, I know, as, as we all have confirmed, is widely understood as a seamstress in early America. But I knew she was an upholsterer. And I wondered what it was about women making furniture that was so hard to reconcile with our popular historical imagination. And so once again, I went off to the library and I thought I would you know, get a book out about Betsy Ross and find out about the life behind the legend. And I went to the library and lo and behold discovered that there wasn't a single scholarly book or article about Betsy Ross in print. There were dozens and dozens of books about Betsy Ross, largely children's literature, juvenile literature. There were a couple of books of um, varying quality, varying interest in scholarly uh, approaches that tried to confirm that the legend as we all know it is true. But there really wasn't any effort to to ground her in any sort of scholarly context. And so I knew that that was a book, given my interest in women and work and artisanry in early America, that I really wanted to tackle. So that's what really drew me into this project. Now you might wonder why there is no biography of Betsy Ross at this late date, she being as famous as she has been for as long as she has been. And the reasons for that are several, and, and come to bear on how I then went about the research for the project. And the key reason is that she left no papers. There is no archive in Philly as lovely as this. There is no archive in Philly as lovely as this. We'll stop there, full stop. Um, but there's no archive that contains the Betsy Ross papers. Uh, Betsy Ross was not famous at the time of her death in 1836. Her obituary did appear in a Philadelphia paper, makes no mention of any flag making at all, simply announces that she's passed and invites friends and family to the house uh, for a service. So there was no reason in 1836 to begin to collect her papers. No letters survive, no shop accounts survive. So recovering her story can't be done in the usual ways. It can't be done by going to the Betsy Ross archive. Um, many of you will know. Anybody from Philadelphia here? Just a couple. Okay. Uh, of course, the Betsy Ross House stands in Philadelphia, and they were pretty much my first stop when I began the research. I'll come back to that in a moment. But they're not able to curate a large collection of Betsy Ross papers because really nothing like that was saved. Another reason that there is no biography of Betsy Ross until now has to do with the history of women's history. And I always think this is a point worth making. Women's history, as many of you may know, is a product of the women's movement of the 1960s and 1970s. So in the 1970s and 1980s, the academic community began to respond to the women's movement as more and more budding historians wanted to study women's history. 
It was the origins of a new field, a field that had to prove itself to the larger scholarly community. And so people really took on very serious scholarly projects. In the 1970s and 80s, you know, again, this is the bicentennial, by that time, Betsy Ross had become a subject of derision, really. People, you know, she's a salt and pepper shaker, right? She's the salt of George Washington's pepper. You know, there, she was not taken seriously as a historical figure, and I, it would have been a career-ending move, I think, back then, to take up the study of Betsy Ross. Since then, a lot of time has passed. Uh, the new cultural history has emerged and is thriving, and so now, at this remove, it's perfectly tenable to go back and sort of review the history of somebody like Betsy Ross. So in a way, the topic is now safe for scholarly study in a way that it really wouldn't have been, you know, 20 years ago for sure. Part of what makes it possible today, and this is, um, is how one addresses this gap in the uh, archival record, is the advent of these powerful databases that exist now for historians. AAS has been really important in helping make these kinds of resources available. There's a database called Early American Imprints that allows me to search in a moment records that it would have taken me a lifetime to read through. It allows you, because you're able to do keyword searches in databases filled with newspapers, to find things you wouldn't have thought to look for. So uh, an example from that kind of research, John Claypool, Betsy's third husband, I just put him in, keyword, what will I find if I look him up in America's Historic Newspapers? And I found his obituary from 1817 in the Philadelphia papers, but also in papers as far north as Boston, all up and down the East Coast. And so I would never have thought to look to see if Claypool's obituary appeared in Boston. It wouldn't have occurred to me that it might have. But the databases bring me these things. And so really, I think this project wouldn't have been possible even five years ago. You just couldn't have lived long enough to sift through all the tiny little, you know, shards of evidence that you really need to to pull together a story like this. So that's how I came about it. And as I say, when I realized that this was a book that it was time to write, when I felt like I was in a pretty good position to do it, I went down to the Betsy Ross house. In, in my job at UMass, I direct the public history program, which means part of my work is training museum professionals and historic preservation professionals. And so I knew that if any place had knowledge of what's out there about Betsy Ross, it would be the Betsy Ross house in Philly. And so I got in the car and I rode down and I made an appointment with the curator and you know, climbed these winding stairs to her office. And she very generously let me start going through her files. And I could see in the things that they had photocopied and the notes they had that there was enough to support at least the beginning of a book. And every few minutes I would look up and I would say, Lisa, really, nobody's tried to do this? And she would say, you know, people don't really think her story is important. And another hour would pass and I would sit through all these other documents and I would say, really, come on, nobody? And she would say, no, not yet. So it really was a matter of being in the right place, I think, very much at the right time. So the key artifacts, the key papers, and, and now I'm moving into how did I go about doing the work, is um, this series of affidavits. The reason that any of us today know who Betsy Ross is, is because in 1870, her grandson gave a talk very much like this one to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And in it, he delivered what he liked to call a report of his family's oral tradition of his grandmother, Betsy, making the flag. Can be really tried to research the question. He really tried to figure out, find the archival smoking gun that would prove that this family story was in fact true. And he wasn't able to find anything. Of course, his uh, access to records wasn't anything like ours today, but he searched where he could search and found nothing that would confirm this story. So in lieu of that, he asked all of the living relatives to go to attorney's offices in their neighborhoods and swear an affidavit, tell the story as they remember hearing it in front of an attorney and at least get it down on paper. And that's how he attempted to fill in the gap. One of the people who was living to do that exercise in 1870 was Betsy's daughter, Rachel, her youngest daughter, and at that time her only surviving daughter. And so there, Rachel Fletcher, you know, signed her name in a very scrawling signature to this account of her mother's story, as she could recall it. 
and then other grandchildren, the children of nieces and nephews, anyone he could find who could remember hearing this story, you know, they filed these affidavits. So that's where I started, because the affidavits have a recounting of the flag story as, as the family had sort of agreed upon it. And also in the margins, other little snippets that help me begin to see, give me opportunities to go check things out. So I'll, I'll tell to you the flag story as, as recorded in these narratives and as it sort of come down to us. In the family legend, in the spring of 76, George Washington, George Ross, and Robert Morris, as a committee of Congress, came to Betsy's shop on Art Street. They had with them a sketch of a flag for the new nation that they had in mind. They gave it to Betsy and said, you know, like, what do you think? Could you make one of these? And she looked at it, and in the legend, she's remembered to have said, you know, like, that's fine. White, red stripes looks good. Blue canton, that's fine. But you've got these six-pointed stars in the canton, and I think there's a better option. And she's said to have folded up this piece of paper just so, and she snips it with her scissors, and out comes this five-pointed star. And, you know, voila, and Washington says, oh, yes, you know, that's wonderful. Let's do that. She's believed to have made up a specimen flag. They take that back to Congress, Congress applauds, yes, let's do that, and that is the flag that we get today. That's the family story as it's delivered in these accounts. Now, before we finish tonight, I'll tell you which parts of that add up and which parts of it don't. Um, I think all of us know that family stories get well and truly muddled and quickly, right? So I think a lot, a lot of the story, people will talk about the Betsy Ross claim, and we have to remember that Betsy didn't live to see it. For all we know, she'd have been horrified by the muddled version that her you know, children and grandchildren put down on paper. But that was the point of departure. But my interest in Betsy Ross was much bigger than that. I didn't want to know just whether she made the flag or not. I wanted to know who she was and what her life was like. And so there are other little parts of the, the affidavits that gave me clues there, too. Uh, for instance, one of the affidavits says, that she got her first job in the upholstery shop of a guy named John Webster, also on Art Street, and that she was there to visit her sister, and one of the girls in the shop was having a problem with a project she'd been assigned. And Betsy said, oh, I could do that. She you know, whips it out and finishes it, and Webster's so impressed by the beauty and neatness of her stitches that he goes to her mother and says, can she work for me? Now, whether or not, you know, the story in many ways is, is told to show Betsy as a needlework prodigy, you know, who's going to go on and make a, you know, contribution to the nation through her needle. But it tells us other things, too. It taught me, or told me, or led me to the shop of John Webster. Because one of her sisters is working there, and one of the girls in the shop is having a problem with a project, this implies a group of girls who are working in this shop, um, her sister and others. And sure enough, as I started looking into the upholstery trades in early Philadelphia, I began to see this world of women and work. And most upholstery shops probably employed more women than men. Because if you think about upholstery, and I'm looking around and not seeing much to point at here, but if you think about the long seams that drapes require, applying the fringe to the bottoms of things, making the fringe, making the tassels on curtains, the slip covers on chairs, um, all of that sewing, was done by women in these shops, and Betsy Ross was one of them, and that's how she got her start in the needle trades. So all of these little stories in the affidavit started leading me to this larger world of Betsy Ross. And I really wanted to embed her, not just in revolutionary Philadelphia, but also in the life of her family. And so I began looking at her siblings, and that became a really important part of the story for me. Betsy Ross was one of 17 children. So filling out the lives of her siblings, and especially her sisters, really taught me a lot. All of us know that the things that happen to our sisters and brothers affect us too, the things that happen to our parents. And so by telling their stories in the absence of her papers, I hoped I could cast some reflected light back on the kinds of things she experienced. And so I'll tell you about one of those stories. Uh, because I think it illuminates a lot, not just about the world she lived in, but about the way a person can recover that world. So Betsy Ross was raised a Quaker. Her parents were Samuel and Rebecca Griscom. They were uh, both members of the Quaker faith. Betsy was born in 1752. She had five older sisters. And as some of you may know, in the 18th century, the Quaker faith required that you marry within the faith. And if you marry outside the faith, 
you're disciplined by the faith, and perhaps disowned by the faith. And so the procedure, the Quakers were a very methodical procedural people, and they have left wonderful papers that document that, so that became an important source for me. In the Quaker faith, if somebody makes an error, a team of Quakers of your gender are dispatched to discuss this problem with you. And so they will come to your home, and they will say, so you've made a mistake, and I'm, I'm sure you're regretful. And you might say, um, you know, yes, I'm truly sorry that I erred that way. It'll never happen again. And a procedure then is followed to what's called restore unity. And so you might come to the meeting, and a statement is read that critiques your behavior, and then you read a statement that accepts responsibility, promises it won't happen again, and all is well. Typically, in 18th century Philadelphia, that might take about six months to unfold, because there's a certain amount of deliberation and contemplation as people are preparing to restore unity. Betsy, as many people may know, um, eloped to New Jersey to get married in 73. It's the heat of the uh, tea crisis, and she and John Ross, another member of the staff at the upholstery shop, elope over the river and get married in New Jersey, and she is disowned for this action. People in Philadelphia like to make a lot of that. You know, it's, it's a romantic story, it's dramatic, and it paints a certain picture of her as a headstrong young woman, in love, willing to take risks. And so I, you know, had become aware of that part of her story, too. Well, once I turned to the archive to learn about her various siblings, I learned that when Betsy was disowned in 73 for marrying outside the faith, her parents were five for five. And in fact, they, too, had married uh, outside discipline, not according to discipline, uh, because, well, they were accused of having an unchaste intimacy, I think is the phrase in the record of parents. Um, so, we can return to that, but they, they restored their unity with the church, raised their children in the Quaker faith, and then as their girls enter their teenage years and start to marry, every single one of them married contrary to discipline. Um, in, in most cases, they were disciplined for marrying outside the faith. Uh, one sister was disciplined for having a child outside of wedlock. Now, so the two sisters closest to Betsy were Susanna and Mary. Susanna married outside the faith. Mary was the one with the illegitimate child. Susanna, when, when she's approached by the community to say, you know, you have air, and would you like to repair things? You know, she's really on the fence about it. And month after month goes by, and the Quaker records say, she thinks she might be sorry, but she's not sure she's sorry. She's kind of sorry, but, you know. So, she, so month after month, she's like, I'm not so sure. So finally she says, you know what? I really am. I'm sorry. You know, I'll come to the meeting and we'll, you know, let's, let's get this done. And so they say, great, we'll see you at the October meeting. We'll have the testimony. Let's do it. And the October meeting comes and the, the meeting gets a message. She's under the weather. Can't make it. See you in November. So then the November meeting rolls around. Once again, there's a message. No, this is no good for me either. Next month? Next month good for you? And so she continues to put it off and put it off and put it off. Finally, it's over a year later. And Susanna says, you know what, I, I'm, I don't feel that I'm, in fact, sorry enough to proceed and, you know, well, let's just call it a day. So month after month had gone by, Betsy saw all that happen. When Mary also was brought before the meeting for her um, illegitimate child, she too dragged it out month after month after month. And, and finally, in the end, she too decides, you know, she's got this beautiful baby boy. She decides that she's not sorry enough to go through the uh, restoration of unity. When Betsy's turn comes, and they dispatch the team of Quakers to confer with her about her actions, she right away says, you know what? Let's not do it. I'm going to worship at Christ Church, and you know, thank you for everything. <laughs> so, so in the absence of a large body of papers, one has to interpret that as, as one might. And so I see in that, but this is the conceit of the author, I see in that a certain headstrong quality and a certain decisiveness. So in, in the book I propose, if, if those of you know the Myers-Briggs um, dualities, that Betsy was an out-and-out J, judging. Like, she's ready, she makes a decision, and she sticks with it. You see that in other ways, too. Um, as was mentioned, Betsy Ross was married three times. She married as a young woman, and
and uh, was widowed early. John Ross died, and so they married in 73. John Ross died in January of 76. Under a little bit of mysterious circumstances, we can come back to if you guys want to in the Q&A. So then she's widowed. This is the season the flag episode will occur, and so we'll come back to that too. She remarries again in 77 to a man named Joseph Ashburn. He was a mariner, and so during the war he became a privateer. He was captured at sea and imprisoned in England where he died, probably of some you know, prison-related illness. So in 1781, she's widowed. John Claypool had been in the ground troops during the revolution, had been injured, left the service, came back as a, he, he also signed up on a privateering ship. He also was captured at sea, taken to the same prison. He knew Ashburn, was with Ashburn when he died. And so after he returned to Philadelphia, he paid a call on Ashburn's widow, and within a year's time, they were married. So you see her too, again, you know, demographers have calculated the average amount of time that elapses between a widowhood and a remarriage in 18th century Philadelphia. And again, Betsy is way under the average. <laughs> and I, I read in that, I get a certain decisiveness. You know, she does not strike me as a woman who dilly-dallied, she was quick to make decisions. And I think she was um, tenacious in a way. And I, I think there's a lot of evidence for tenacity in her life, um, which we will come to as well. Um, so another example of that sort of determination, I think, in her world that has to do with her faith as well is, many of you may know, the Quakers have a pacifism, a tenet of pacifism in their faith. And during the war, the Quakers were encouraged by their meetings to try to stay neutral, try to stay out of it if you can. And uh, some Quakers tried to or did, and others did not. Others embraced the revolution and accepted the consequences for that. And through the course of the war, ever larger numbers of Quakers in Philadelphia were disowned for their military activity or some form of support for the war. And in time, all of those disowned Quakers got together and they formed their own meeting. Not all of them were disowned for military activity. Betsy, you now know, was disowned for her marriage out of unity. But disowned, this community of disowned Quakers gathered together and called themselves the Free Quakers. And they started a meeting really grounded. It was very much like any other Quaker meeting, but they embraced one core principle, and that was a rejection of the, of the practice of um, disownment. They felt that no man should sit in judgment of another man, and they believed in a radical freedom of conscience. And Betsy and her, by then husband John Claypool, joined that church pretty early on. And as, as the war ended and time passed, many members of that meeting drifted back to their home communities. But Betsy, and this is one of those things, as legend has it, I've never been able to document this archivally, but there's a family tradition that Betsy hung in until the bitter end. The Free Quakers was a community founded by a guy named Samuel Wetherill. And legend has it that Betsy and Samuel's son John were the last two members to attend worship in the Free Quaker Society. And finally, the two of them you know, shook hands and said, two does not a meeting make. And that was the end of the Free Quaker meeting. But she hung in right till the end. Uh, the Free Quaker community still exists in Philadelphia as a philanthropic society, but that was the end of the meeting for worship. And again, she stayed right till the end. So I see in her you know, a certain amount of determination. Part of that also is shown in the fact that she worked really over six decades to keep her family together. And that's what I find to be so uh, moving and important about Betsy Ross. It's really not whether or not she made a flag on a particular afternoon, but this lifetime of becoming the center of gravity for her whole family. So let me tell you a little bit about what I found about her life and what I think happened with the flag story. And then about, uh, about the larger career as a flag maker that she had during the War of 1812. Um, so Betsy was born in 1752. She went off to work in this upholstery shop, and that's where she got the training that would sustain her through most of her life. As I mentioned, she buried two husbands early. She and John Ross would have been great partners in an upholstery shop. Uh, John would have been trained to do that sort of stuffing of furniture and those kinds of things that we think of when we think of upholstery. Betsy knew how to do all that sort of simple sewing, the assemblage of the slip covers and the curtains and the Venetian blinds. So as a pair, they were really well positioned to do well in Philadelphia. 
And they were getting all the right clients. They worked with the Chews, they worked with the Tillmans, like the future looked bright until John died. Betsy probably stayed in Philadelphia through the war. I think she stayed through the occupation in Philadelphia. When she married John Claypool, her third husband, this is what finally will give her the family that she had been seeking. She had two children with her second husband, Ashburn, only one of which survived infancy. So she was a young mother with a little toddler when she married Claypool. They had five more daughters together. She would have five daughters and all that would survive till adulthood. And so that's the family that they raised. John Claypool worked as a customs officer. Uh, one of the things that really interests me about Betsy Ross is her worldliness. One of the things that the popular historical imagination paints, the picture it paints of her, is in her parlor, right? You can all kind of conjure up that iconic image of Betsy Ross giving the flag to Washington in her parlor. And I, I like to think of Betsy in her upholstery shop, for one thing, with the goods of the world passing through her shop, but also Claypool being a customs inspector. His job, when ships came into the port of Philadelphia from all over the world, his job was to take the manifest, what they said was in the hold, and see what was actually in the hold, and to make any corrections or adjustments. So, you know, they knew everything that was coming into the port from all over the world, and the generation of Betsy's sons-in-law and her nephews, many of them became ship captains and traders. She had nephews in New Orleans, she had nephews who were ship captains sailing the globe, by this time in her life, Betsy and her family lived on 74th South Front Street, and the letters that I've seen that arrived in that house are coming from Lisbon and Belize and you know all over the globe. So they knew when the price of salt was good and when tobacco would sell high. They all of that information passing through the house. So I, I see them as having broad horizons, but also Betsy really became, in through the years, the anchor of her family. So she had these girls, they married, and several of them were also widowed young, moved back to Philadelphia and brought their children. So Betsy's home, as she got older, became fuller. As the children came back, the grandchildren came back. As her older sisters died, their children moved in with Aunt Claypool. And so by the early 19th century, this house on Front Street is full of girls, and they are all helping in a very thriving flag-making business. One of the things we know about um, Betsy Ross in these years are that she made many, many flags for the military. Garrison flags, Indian flags, and so while you know, the preoccupation about Betsy Ross's flag-making tends to focus on 76, and there's one receipt for her making flags during the revolution itself in May of 77 for the Pennsylvania Navy, there are many, many documents that show her making flags for the U.S. government in the run-up to the War of 1812. And so say between 1806 and 1811, she was making garrison flags that went up to Niagara, down to New Orleans, all around the eastern seaboard. These garrison flags were huge, bigger than the footprint of her house at the time. I think her house at the time was about 450 square feet on any given floor, and these flags would have been folded to about 480. So she's making these massive flags with the help of her daughter and their children. They also made flags for the Indian Bureau. In the early 19th century, as many of you know, the government sent expeditions west, up and down the Mississippi, up and down different rivers, exploring and uh, creating relations with native nations along the way. Those uh, expeditions were always outfitted with various trade goods for contact, and a lot of that was silver, but some of it was flags. And so there are these really spectacular Indian flags, trade flags, that are the red and white stripes that we associate with our national flag. And then in the canton, there is a painted eagle. Betsy worked with a shop painter named William Barrett. He applied the eagle to the canton with the help of his apprentices, and those flags, too, went all over the place. So I like to imagine, again, when I'm thinking of the more worldly Betsy Ross, that the products of her handiwork went everywhere that the U.S. was in the early history of the nation. That work kept her and Clarissa well and truly occupied. They actively sought contracts from the Navy. I always think of Betsy Ross as the first government contractor. That's how we really want to think about her. Um, they worked until 1827 and then Betsy retired from business. Clarissa would work until the 1850s. 
Um, I'll come back to Clarissa in a minute, but I just want to touch now on that flag story that I opened with and talk about what there adds up and what doesn't. So, Betsy Ross, in the spring of 76, looking for these flag contracts. That all adds up. In the winter ahead of that, 75-76, Continental Congress has begun building a navy. They're preparing for war. They've approved the construction of various ships and the refitting of various ships. All of those ships need suites of flags. Flags in this period were utilitarian articles needed to convey information across distances at sea. Every ship needed many of them. And women around Philadelphia, women whose names we know, were getting those contracts. And so I can see the young widow, Betsy Ross, wondering what she's going to do for a livelihood now that John is dead, thinking that's a Rolodex I'd like to be on. And so when those guys start coming around the city, of course she would be eager to get that kind of a contract. Washington was indeed in the city in the season that the family remembers this event to have happened. We know that he was going around to the various shops of artisans because he picks up, among other things, the tents that were made by the upholsterer Plunkett Fleeson, which today has continued to survive, one at the Smithsonian and one at Valley Forge, the tents used from the Valley Forge encampment. So we know Washington was going around the city, collecting things that he needs. George Ross and Robert Morris said to be with him as a committee of Congress. This cannot be true. George Ross would become a member of Congress, but in spring of 76, he was not yet elected. Robert Morris was a member of Congress that season, but Morris opposed independence. In fact, when the boat comes up in July, he stays home. He can see which way the wind is blowing. He doesn't want to stand in the way of what's going to happen, but he does not want to participate in it, so he stays home. I don't think he would be serving on a committee to get a new national flag in May or June of that year. So I think those three guys were going around getting things that they need, and I think there's every reason to believe they would approach Betsy Ross about it. George Ross is John's uncle. He knows that Betsy needs, you know, an income. Every reason to think he'd steer something her way. And um, so that all ends up fine. But there cannot have been a committee of Congress. These guys cannot have been on it because there is no record in Congress of any such committee existing, of anything coming back to Congress for their approval. That kind of thing would have survived in the, you know, voluminous records associated with the Continental Congress, and it just doesn't. So that, that particular moment cannot have happened. But I think, I think the part that rings truest and the part that I really love about Betsy Ross is that moment where she cuts the star. You know, I'm interested in women at work. I'm interested in artisanal skill. And so what I see and hear in that story is Betsy Ross as a producer, as a fabricator, saying, if you need a lot of these and fast, I'm telling you that these five-pointed stars are a lot easier to make. And she does the folding and she snips the thing and out comes the star and Washington's convinced. That part of it is what rings true to me. And I should say that in the affidavits, when the children are recording Betsy's story, they do not say that she claims to have made the first flag. They say that she claims to have met Washington. There was nobody more important than George Washington in the early republic. And I think that is the heart of her story. She met, you know, the founder of the nation and taught him a little something. And that's what I think she was mostly proud of. That's what I think that story was about. Um, she doesn't claim to have made the first flag. She doesn't claim to have put the stars in a circle, the way we talk about the Betsy Ross flag today. All of that came later. It came from these 19th century generations. And, and I'll say that I think we have really Clarissa her daughter to thank for that. Clarissa was her oldest daughter with John Claypool. Clarissa went down to Baltimore uh, when she married, started raising her family there. Her husband died. She's got all these little kids. She left Baltimore, came back to Philly. Right about the same time, another flight-making family that you might know, Rebecca Flower and her daughter Mary Pickersgill, same thing, two widows together, mother and daughter, move to Baltimore. They're there just when a very large banner is needed for Fort McHenry. Betsy Ross and Clarissa have moved back to Philadelphia. They too are interested in making plans in the run up to the war, and they commence this business together and work together for many, many years. 
Betsy dies in 36. Clarissa in 1857 is also getting ready to leave Philadelphia. She's got a daughter who has migrated out to Iowa. And I think that Clarissa just wanted to leave that story in Philadelphia before she went. She sat her nephew down, a guy named, well, Candy. She sent Candy down and said, I want you to take this down. And she told him the story and she asked him to record it. And that was 1857, and he dutifully did that. Those notes, unfortunately, do not survive. Then the Civil War came, people had more important things to think about. But when the war was over, Canby remembered that story, and he wanted to do something with it, so he started to research it. And I just want to mention that one of the documents of that search is here at AAS. Canby was friends, and I think relatives, with a guy named George Lukens, and they knew Henry Preble, who was writing the first history of the flag or had written it. And so there's a little bit of correspondence with them about this cutting of the star business, and so here at AAS, there's a beautiful volume where they have drawn the five-pointed star and tried to figure out the geometry of it. You know, how did Betsy know how to cut it just so? Um, so that's a beautiful thing that's here at AAS. Um, I think Clarissa wanted that story sort of set down before she left. She left the city. Canby picks it up in the post-war period. 1870, he delivers his lecture. It's the onset of the centennial. People are in the mood to think about the founding of the nation. It's also the middle of the suffrage movement. Well, I say middle. It's, we are in the suffrage movement, which took an unduly long time. And so people are interested in finding women to add to that pantheon of founders. And Betsy Ross was the perfect person at the right time. You could add a woman to the pantheon of founders, but her contribution was not political. It was not military. It was domestic. And so for the people who really wanted to see women in that story, they could find one. Betsy Ross, first flag. For the people uncomfortable with vaulting women into the public sphere, her contribution was domestic. It was sewing. Or at least it became domesticated. And that's why we tend to forget today that she was an upholsterer and not a simple seamstress. So with that, I think I'll close because I'm mostly eager to hear what questions you might have about her life. 